Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, I will get started with uh, some basic introductions. Um, welcome again to the fifth in our series of respiratory pathogens webinars. Today we'll be talking about pneumoviridae and in particular uh, respiratory syncytial virus. Um, <clears throat> my name is Anna Maria Nievedomska and I'm a bioinformatics analyst and the outreach coordinator for IRD and Viper here at JCVI. Uh, my colleagues uh, Yun Zheng and Richard Sherman, uh, the director of informatics here at JCVI, will be joining me to help answer any questions. And um, later, at, in about an hour, we'll be joined by Dr. Christopher Anderson from the University of Rochester, who's going to be sharing some of his work on RSV. Um, just a quick idea of the structure. I'm going to provide a brief overview of the new Moverde family before we get started. Um, and then I will go through a quick demo and tour of the Viper New Moverde page. We'll have time for any questions that you might have before our guest lecturer um, gives his talk. And then we we'll, should have some time for questions and uh, wrap up uh, at the most by uh, 10. <laughs> and <clears throat> so just to tell you a little bit about who we are um, and who pays for <laughs> all this research, um, we are uh, part of the Bioinformatics Resource Centers, which was first established in 2004 with the goal of providing a free and public platform uh, to both be able to search data and uh, provide analysis tools for um, um, all types of genomic data and um, related analyses. And these are focused mainly on category A through C infectious diseases, um, as well as their host interactions. And as part of that, we provide outreach, um, which includes bioinformatics training, uh, either at our BRC sites or at conferences, or uh, for institutions that specifically request it. And uh, we do that for free. Um, and as part of our uh, mandate also, uh, we respond uh, to new threats and emerging uh, pandemic threats, such as obviously SARS-CoV-2, for which we've established a page as well as some tools and which we addressed in uh, maybe a month ago in our seminar. So right now, uh, the BRCs are divided into two uh, centers, the Bacterial and Viral Bioinformatics Resource Center, which we are part of, and that includes the influenza the research database, the virus pathogen resource, and our partners who focus on bacterial pathogens over at Patrick. Um, <clears throat> and uh, joining us, partnering with us for this webinar is uh, VU PathDB, which focuses on uh, other eukaryotic pathogens um, and who in a couple of weeks will be presenting a webinar on aspergillus. So today's focus is pneumoviridae. Um, and to just give you an idea of uh, where these viruses sit in um, the viral uh, families, they belong to an order called mononegaviralis, which means um, negative stranded RNA viruses. And they're related to a few other viruses, which you probably know of, including the Rhabdoviridae, uh, Paramyxoviridae. Um, <clears throat> but they're off on a branch on their own. Uh, over here, and they include metanumovirus and respiratory syncytial virus. They're enveloped, they're pleomorphic, which means they can either be spherical or filamentous. They're relatively small, about 150 to 200 nanometers in diameter. And as I mentioned, they are negative sense single stranded RNA viruses, which are approximately uh, 15 kilobase pairs in size and encode um, at the most 11 proteins and some uh, nine proteins. There are two uh, basic genera, and these are the metanumovirus and orthonumovirus uh, uh, genera, and five major species. So the metanumovirus has avian metanumovirus and human metanumovirus, which is uh, the branch that infects humans. And for the orthonumovirus, these include, uh, these have three major species, which include bovine orthonumovirus, which infects uh, cattle and other bovine species, the human orthonumovirus, which includes uh, RSV um, 
two, which has two major species, RSV uh, A2 and B1. And then there's uh, <clears throat> murine orthonumovirus, which can infect uh, mice, swine, dogs, and then there's a few unclassified. And this is just a basic tree showing uh, their relationship to each other. Um, so just to get started with um, basic introduction to the types of uh, diseases that they cause and how they're transmitted, RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, and human metanumovirus are the two that are most relevant to humans. And they can cause severe disease, especially in infants and children, um, and those people, those who are immunocompromised and um, elderly. However, in adults, um, disease is usually mild, but uh, mortality and morbidity in uh, certain age groups is significant. And both of them target the upper respiratory tract, but um, can move to lower respiratory tract in more serious cases and cause uh, severe bronchiolitis and lower respiratory tract infections. Transmission, like many respiratory viruses, is through droplet transmission, although there is some evidence for um, some fomite transmission. Um, <clears throat> So let's start with orthonumovirus because this is the one that was first discovered. And this was discovered in 1955 and it was isolated from uh, chimpanzees suffering uh, from a respiratory illness. And uh, eventually this was isolated from humans and found to be a human disease. And this is divided into uh, human respiratory syncytial virus A and B. And they have multiple clades and genotypes, depending on which paper you read. There is no consensus in the field yet, um, so it's, it's a little complicated. RSVA is generally more virulent than RSVB. Both of them have a global distribution and uh, their, uh, their occurrence is seasonal, uh, similar to influenza, so um, it requires a little bit uh, it requires some uh, genetic testing to be able to identify the cause of disease. Human metanumovirus, on the other hand, was discovered more recently, um, and it was isolated in 2001 in the Netherlands, and it's the second most common cause um, after respiratory syncytial virus for lower respiratory tract infections in young children. And again, it also has a global distribution and is seasonal, uh, similar to influenza and RSV, although uh, its infections with metanumovirus peak slightly after the peak of influenza and RSV. Moving on to the virus structure, um, as I mentioned, this is an enveloped virus. Um, so this is a quick idea of the genome. And on the outside, um, you have the membrane envelope, which contains uh, several structural proteins, including uh, the G glycoprotein, which I'll discuss a little bit more shortly, uh, the fusion glycoprotein. And um, <clears throat> uh, once you go further inside the caps, inside the virion, you can find uh, other structural proteins, including uh, uh, the M protein, the matrix protein, and the M2 matrix protein. Inside the capsid, you have uh, the nucleocapsid proteins, uh, as well as some uh, non-structural proteins, which protect the negative strand mRNA inside the capsid. So again, this is the genome structure. Um, and just to give you a quick idea of what the functions of these different proteins are, um, the F protein is the fusion protein, and this is a type one fusion glycoprotein, which is uh, responsible for the virus host cell membrane fusion. Uh, the G protein uh, facilitates virus attachment through interactions with uh, glycosaminoglycans um, and heparin sulfate on the host cell. Um, and then we have uh, two matrix proteins, the M protein, which enables um, N and envelope interactions, the nucleocapsid and envelope interactions, and uh, the M2 protein, which um, actually has two overlapping open reading frames and um, has functions in um, <clears throat> protecting uh, and binding nascent uh, mRNA and uh, facilitates transcription and uh, replication of these viruses. 
the nucleocapsid protein uh, is involved in replication and transcription and, of course, uh, forms viral capsids. So, in terms of the non-structural proteins, we have the phosphoprotein, which uh, is involved in, um, which facilitates RNA-dependent RNA polymerase attachment and recruits the M2 protein. The SH protein is a small hydrophobic protein. Its function is unknown, uh, but it's thought that it can alter membrane permeability and block apoptosis. Um, and finally, uh, we have the large L protein, uh, which uh, is the the polymerase, the RNA dependent RNA polymerase, and this can uh, add a phi prime cap and is also responsible for poly A tailing of the uh, mRNAs, the viral mRNAs. And then um, in some viruses, not not all pneumoviruses, we have the NS1 and NS2 non structural proteins, which uh, together are thought to inhibit uh, apoptosis and uh, modulate interferon responses. Um, so, as I mentioned, uh, there are some important differences between the, the different viruses. So, orthoneumovirus, which has uh, the human respiratory syncytial virus um, species in it, is slightly longer. It's about 15 kb instead of uh, 13 kb, which is the which is the length of the human metaneumovirus. And it does have these two additional proteins, which I just mentioned, the non-structural protein one and two. Um, and then one final difference that I wanted to point out is that while they may have uh, the same proteins or most of the same proteins, arrangements might be different. So uh, the fusion protein and M2 protein over here are adjacent to the polymerase with a slight overlap in open reading frames um, and the and the SH and the G glycoprotein are upstream of that, whereas this order is reversed in human metanumovirus. So <clears throat> I'd like to just talk a little bit next about um, the glycoprotein, the G glycoprotein. Um, and this is important uh, because it facilitates viral attachment. Uh, most of all, it's about 300 amino acids uh, in length. It can be very variable uh, in terms of its amino acid content, and it's a type 2 um, integral membrane protein. And it can, it can have two forms, either full-length membrane-bound, or it can be secreted. Um, <clears throat> the N-terminus of the protein is cytosolic, um, and it's quite short. It has a single transmembrane protein, uh, transmembrane domain, which goes through um, the cell membrane once, or the, the, the membrane once, and a large ectodomain, uh, which forms the majority of the, the protein. And this ectodomain contains uh, two variable regions, two variable mucin-like domains, and a central, uh, very conserved region, which uh, is the heparin uh, binding domain. Um, it's heavily, uh, there's a lot of post-translational modification that takes place on this protein. It's heavily glycosylated by both N-linked and O-linked glycans. And in fact, um, approximately 60% of the molecular mass uh, of the protein comes from these sugars. Um, <clears throat> but then you also have the, the secreted form, which uh, is translated from an alternative start codon, uh, methionine 48 which is uh, somewhere in the middle of the transmembrane domain. So after this is translated, proteolysis takes place and uh, soluble G protein can be secreted. And it's thought that this acts as um, an antigenic decoy uh, for antibodies. Um, <clears throat> so the very, and the last thing I just wanted to mention is that the variable mucin-like domains, the variable regions, which flank this conserved central region um, are responsible for the antigenic grouping of uh, respiratory syncytial virus into RSVA and RSVB. <clears throat> so the other important protein to discuss is the fusion glycoprotein. And this one is slightly larger. It's about uh, 570 amino acids. Uh, it's a class one viral fusion glycoprotein, uh, which means that it generally does not need a pH change to uh, enable fusion. Uh, again, there are uh, post-translational 
post translational modifications, which uh, can either be five or six and length glycans. And um, in its fusion competent form, it does need to be cleaved at two polybasic sites by furin like host proteases, um, which generate the F2 and F1 subunits. Together, um, these subunits form a heterodimeric protomer, uh, which then form into a trimer, which forms the, the mature um, F protein, which has this uh, structure of uh, transmembrane domain over here and this large globular uh, domain at the surface. Uh, now, although this domain is looks spherical at the moment, it's actually quite unstable and dynamic, so it can uh, fold and unfold, exposing uh, the fusion uh, peptides. And once this protein gets close to a membrane, it can insert the fusion peptides into the host membrane, uh, thereby enabling fusion of the virion and uh, the host. So this is just a quick overview of the replication. We start with attachment of the G protein to the heparin sulfate to um, the CXCR uh, uh, chemokine receptor 1. And uh, again, you know, there's the conserved uh, cysteine uh, motif in uh, <clears throat> the G protein. And the F protein may uh, interact with several proteins, including ICAM1, EGFR, and nucleolin. And um, this can enable uh, endocytosis with fusion within the endosome or uh, fusion at the cell surface. So after that, uh, replication takes place in the cytoplasm where transcription of mRNAs uh, takes place from the negative strand. After translation takes place and enough uh, proteins accumulate, uh, then replication of the genome takes place, and eventually proteins, uh, viral, structural viral proteins start to accumulate at the cell surface where um, assembly takes place and new variants can bud So in terms of genomic diversity, there was a, a recent paper that I will point you to over here that looked at the genomic diversity of human metanumovirus, if you're interested in that, and divided that into five distinct lineages, A1, A2A, A2B, B1 and 2. Um, they found that recombination was relatively rare and that all metanumoviruses uh, shared common ancestor somewhere between 220 and 470 years ago. Uh, they were able to find purifying selection in uh, all genes and episodic diversifying selection in most, with the exception of F, M2, um, and M22. And uh, they found that generally these five lineages were quite stable in their individual evolutionary dynamics. Um, the genomic diversity of human respiratory syncytial virus is a little bit more complicated, um, but I would direct you to this uh, paper if you're interested in that. It was, um, it was quite thorough. And uh, over here is just a tree showing respiratory syncytial virus A um, and one for respiratory syncytial virus B. So again, there's quite a lot of branching and where you decide um, to select a genotype can be a little bit complicated depending on which protein you're looking at and what your uh, cutoffs are. Um, but they found that there's basically two antigenically distinct uh, viruses, um, RSV A and B, and that they can co-circulate um, through one season or uh, one may pr predominate alternatively. Uh, clustering of the genotypes can be geographic, although there was a stronger signal for temporal clustering. Um, selection can be driven by short-lived uh, herd immunity uh, to a specific uh, genotype, which obviously will lead to circulation of other genotypes. Um, and I will just point out that uh, there is a recent emergence of two RSV um, A and B genotypes, which have duplications in them that may confer evolutionary advantages. So uh, early RSV uh, genotypes differ quite, um, quite significantly from uh, the more recent ones. 
Um, several genes undergo positive selection, uh, in particular, the variable regions in the G protein that I mentioned previously. Um, and the most recent common ancestor for RSV uh, A and B is more recent than that of metanumoviruses, which um, are, is about 24 to 50 for RSV B and about uh, 50 to 60 years for RSV A. Um, going over what is available to treat these uh, viruses, um, there's not much that's available for um, in terms of uh, drugs, it's mostly uh, supportive care. Ribavirin is the only approved uh, drug, and it's a guanosine analog. Uh, there is one experimental uh, fusion inhibitor that's still uh, in trials. Bronchodilators are not recommended. Uh, similarly, anti-inflammatories, although they have been used. Antibiotics are only recommended if a secondary bacterial infection is present. Um, <clears throat> monoclonal antibodies, uh, there are several in clinical trials. Uh, one is has been approved by the FDA, but it uh, res has restricted use because of its modest efficacy. In terms of vaccines, there are currently no approved uh, vaccines available, despite um, this, the significant morbidity and mortality that these viruses cause. Um, and this is largely because early attempts to develop a vaccine to RSV resulted in um, quite a serious problem in people called um, vaccine-associated enhanced respiratory disease. Um, and this was... Um, what happened was basically that the people who had gotten the vaccine when they were then infected with uh, the virus actually had uh, a worse outcome than those uh, who had not been vaccinated. So this kind of just put people off of um, <clears throat> looking for uh, vaccines for this family for quite a while. but. Uh, the good news is that currently there are at least uh, 38 respiratory syncytial virus vaccines in development, and uh, 15 are currently in trials, and um, they vary in terms of uh, the types of vaccines, whether they're particle, subunit, vector-based, or um, even live attenuated. For human metanumovirus, there is one uh, vaccine currently in development, and it's an mRNA vaccine, which is a combination of human metanumovirus and parainfluenza virus. And um, the viral targets for these viruses can vary significantly um, and include many of the different uh, viral proteins that we discussed. So this is just a table summarizing uh, the basic differences between uh, respiratory syncytial virus and met human metanumovirus. Um, and I'll, um, <clears throat> uh, since I'm a little bit short on time, I'm just going to skip over this and just remind you that um, we still have a few upcoming uh, webinars, including one on aspergillus in, in a couple of weeks. In a month, we'll be discussing uh, enteroviruses, uh, which includes uh, picornaviridae and uh, rhinoviruses. And um, after that, we will also have one last session on bacterial respiratory pathogens. And that is it. So I will open it up for questions before I move on to a live demo of the site. So, this is the virus pathogen resource site, if you're not already familiar with it. And I'll just make that a little bit bigger so it's easy to see. Um, you can find us by going to viperbrc.org. And um, this is our basic layout for the page. We have our search section where you can look for different types of data, our analysis section where you can browse through the different tools that are available. Um, <clears throat> and our workbench where you can save your data and um, store your analysis. So if you scroll down to our um, virus families section, you will find pneumoviridae underneath the single-stranded negative sense RNA section. And if you just go ahead and click on pneumoviridae, that will take you to the page. And again, over here, you can see the three different um, ways that you can browse this site. 
If you scroll down, you will find our taxonomy browser where you can uh, search for viruses that you might be interested in. Um, and here are the two uh, genera that I mentioned, the metanumovirus, which has a human metanumovirus in it, as well as avian metanumovirus, if that's what you're interested in, and the orthonumovirus, which contains um, the human, bovine, and murine orthonumoviruses. And if you look over here, um, obviously uh, RSV is the one where people have been researching the longest, so that's the one we have the most data for, followed by uh, the human metanumovirus. So going up to um, our search section, I'm going to click on that and just show you real quick how you can browse through the data. You can look for genomes or proteins or particular strain that you're interested in. Um, and I'll go over a couple of these other uh, search uh, data types in a second. Um, <clears throat> so most people just want to look for genomes or proteins for the viruses that they're interested in. Um, and there's a few different ways to do that. If you just are interested in the genomes, um, you can search by taxonomy. Um, if you're interested just in metanumoviruses, you can click select all. If you don't want all metanumoviruses, you just want the human ones, you can just open that up and uh, click select all for human metanumovirus. Um, and what's nice about this is that um, we retrieve the counts for you uh, right away, depending on your selection. So this just gives you an idea of what's there. So for human metanumovirus, there's about um, just under 10,000 sequences. Uh, and if you're interested only in the complete genome, let's say you'd like to make a full genome alignment for everything that's there, you can select um, those viruses that only have a complete genome, uh, and that returns about 158. If you'd like to specify a particular collection year, let's say you're only interested in the 2009-2010 uh, season, you can uh, do that over here. Um, just select 2009-2010, and that will give you um, <clears throat> the accounts for that. Um, if you're interested in a specific geographic grouping, you're only interested in those circulating in North America um, or Asia for a particular period, you could do that as well. Um, if you're particularly interested, let's say, in a specific host, uh, you could do that. However, in this case, I've already selected uh, only human metanumoviruses. Uh, you can also choose a particular country if you're uh, specifically interested in looking at sequences generated from uh, a certain country. Um, so in this case, there were only two sequences uh, isolated for human metanumovirus from China between 2009 and 2020. So if you go ahead and click search, uh, the data is returned to you in a table like this, uh, which provides the strain name. Uh, the virus species, the GenBank accession number, uh, sequence length, and the collection date, and host and country. Uh, you can change the display settings depending on uh, what you're interested in, um, and there's a few different options which I would encourage you to explore over here and how you want to display the data. And finally, you can, um, I just want to point out that you can select your data and <clears throat> Uh, save uh, your uh, save your search um, by clicking um, add to a working set, which uh, you should be logged into your Viper account to be able to save. And then you can either add it to an existing working set or create a new one over here. Um, and what's what's really nice uh, about the Viper site is that um, if you're just interested in getting a quick idea of what's there. Um, and how these viruses are related to each other, you can select them and directly click uh, Run Analysis. So you can look at the different uh, variation that's in the genome. You can create a multiple sequence alignment. Um, you can look at uh, variation between a few different groups based on the metadata that's associated with them using our MetaCats tool. And I'll go over this again in a second. 
Um, or you can just create a, a quick tree um, for for a specific um, <clears throat> sets of viruses to just see how they relate to each other. Um, so going back to uh, the types of data that are available to search, one of the things that uh, I haven't mentioned in my previous uh, webinars is our immune epitope uh, database. So if you click on immune epitope search, this will take you to a page where you can look for um, two types of epitopes. One, those that have been um, experimentally determined, and these come from uh, IEDB and are imported into the Viper database. Or you can select for uh, predicted epitopes, and these uh, are predicted through computational methods using uh, the NetCTL algor algorithm. Um, and if you're interested in how um, we do that, you can click on our SOP documentation or go to the site and <clears throat> explore, explore the data there. Um, there's a couple of different types of immune epitopes, uh, B and T cell epitopes. So if you're interested in one or the other, you can click on that. Uh, and if you're interested in a specific T cell epitope, uh, you can click on MHC. And uh, what's nice is that we also provide you with the ability to select um, whether you're interested um, in a certain MHC class, uh, for example, class one or class two. Um, and if you click on uh, MHC allele class, uh, that will give you the ability to search for class one or class two epitopes. If you have a particular uh, MHC allele in mind, uh, you can also do that over here. So this really gives you um, the ability to drill down into uh, the data that you're interested in looking for uh, with regards to uh, immune epitopes. So if you scroll back up and let's say you're interested in looking at um, respiratory syncytial virus epitopes. So I'm going to go ahead and click on all um, human orthopneumovirus epitopes. And this shows me that there are about 649 uh, experimentally determined and verified epitopes. Uh, obviously, there's more if you click on predicted and you're just interested in exploring those. But for now, I'm going to stick to the experimental ones. If you have a particular epitope ID in mind, you can also search for it here. If you have a particular sequence that you want to uh, search for and find uh, the, all the viruses that contain that epitope, you can uh, put that in here. Um, if you're only interested in epitopes in a particular gene, uh, you can put that in, um, you can input that either over here using the gene product name, for example, um, you know, the um, the G glycoprotein, or you can just put in the symbol over here. So that's what I'm going to do, um, put G. And you can see that the count numbers go down to about 89. <clears throat> so I'm going to go ahead and click on search and show you what that data table looks like. So here is the summary table. Um, if you click on view, it will take you um, directly to the page uh, summarizing the information for that epitope. And that includes um, uh, the assay type that they used um, and gives you the exact details on how they determined, how they experimentally determined um, this epitope and um, <clears throat> gives, you, gives you the links as well. So going back to the results, um, we have in the table the IDB ID for each epitope. Uh, the epitope sequence, how many different proteins in the database uh, contain this specific epitope, uh, and what the protein name is, um, who, what the host was, uh, the, and of course the details of uh, the assay type and results. And um, what's, what's really nice about it is that it also gives you um, details on <clears throat> the MHC uh, allele and class. So that's that's it. If you're interested in searching for um, immune epitopes, um, we also have uh, a couple of different uh, 3D protein structures. If you're interested in looking at um, protein structures, 
and I've gone over this uh, a few different times uh, in other webinars. So I think I will leave it uh, at that um, and move on to the tools that we have available for uh, analyzing the Numeverde family. Uh, of course, we have some traditional tools, uh, which includes uh, blasting for sequences similar to um, the, the um, <clears throat> sequences that you are interested in. Um, we also have primer design, a tool that will help you um, design a primer for uh, your specific region of interest and your specific protein of interest. Um, and we also have some comparative analysis tools such as alignment tools and looking for uh, types of variation, either through just traditional sequence variation or through a metadata driven comparative analysis tool. And this is particularly useful um, for RSV because, as I mentioned, there can be a lot of uh, geographic differences and temporal differences in um, in the types of uh, circulating genomes. Um, <clears throat> so there's also the the short peptide search tool, and this can be useful. Uh, let's say, for example, you're interested in looking for a specific motif in uh, a protein, and um, <clears throat> you'd like to find all the different proteins that contain this motif. Uh, so, for example, I mentioned that the G glycoprotein contains a conserved um, <clears throat> motif with uh, cysteines, uh, the CX3C motif. So you can um, perform a pattern match and click on C, put three X's and another C, and this will uh, return uh, the results for uh, that specific pattern. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, uh, you can, if you have a particular motif uh, in mind, for example, um, I have an example here of a specific cysteine motif, um, which you can see here contains four different cysteines, one, two, three, and four. And this is the specific, um, <clears throat> this is the specific um, cysteine motif. Um, you can just click search for that if you um, want all of the genomes that have that exact pattern. Or um, an option that I like is the fuzzy match, which is the <clears throat> um, gives you things that are uh, approximately 50% identical to the string. And I'm going to go ahead and click on uh, run. Oh, I forgot to select the database that I'm interested in. Uh, so what's nice also about the Viper site is it allows you to search for these motifs in pre-built databases. For example, um, if you only want to look at orthonumovirus or metanumovirus or all of the different uh, uh, numeveridae proteins. So I'm going to go ahead and click on run. Um, and while we wait for that, I'll just point out that you can um, <clears throat> request a notification for when this is done or you can just uh, give it a name and click save to your workbench so that you don't have to um, uh, just sit here and wait for it uh, to finish. And this is uh, usually pretty quick, uh, but just in case it's not, I do have um, an example saved to my workbench to give you an idea of what that looks like. Um, <clears throat> so for example, this will show you uh, all of the different strains that contain that particular sequence, give you the species name, uh, the type of protein, and the specific uh, motif that's contained in that protein. So I'm just going to pause for a second and check for questions and comments before moving on to uh, other things that you can do on the Viper site. Okay, so um, going back to our tools, um, <clears throat> again, you can um, perform comparative sequence analysis by um, just looking at variation. And um, for that, uh, 
you can use a couple of different tools, the, the single nucleotides um, uh, polymorphism tool, which will just compare a group one sequence or a couple of sequences against each other and look for uh, individual positions where variation occurs or the metadata driven comparative analysis tool, which um, you can use to compare, let's say, sequences from one year versus sequences from another or sequences from one country um, to sequences uh, from <clears throat> another country. Um, and I have a pre-selected data set over here. Um, oh, I, maybe before I go on, I see a question. Okay, so uh, feel free to either unmute yourself and ask your question in person, or you could type it into the chat. Um, is there a limited number of sequences for um, for the multiple sequence alignment? Um, I think I think there is up to a point, but I can't remember what it is. I think we allow quite a large number of sequences for multiple sequence alignments in Metanuma Verde because they're relatively short. Uh, Richard, do you um, can you remember off the top of your head what the limit is? Yeah, I'm not sure what the upper limit is. I, I know that you can definitely do a thousand sequences, but I think the limit is higher than that, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I think it's you can do quite a large number of sequences for Numa Verde. Okay. Um, all right, so going back to um, the, the Metacats uh, tool. <laughs> You can um, choose. You can choose. For example, um, what I've done is I have a group of sequences where I took some early uh, RS, uh, early metanumovirus, human metanumovirus sequences. Um, some of the ones that were first discovered from uh, 2001 um, to 2005, I think. So the first five years of when metanumoviruses were discovered. And I compared those to um, those that were isolated in uh, the last five years. And I'm going to show you uh, that data set over here, which I have saved to my workbench. So I have about 100 different proteins, um, which contain the G glycoprotein. <clears throat> and like I said, the first half of these were isolated uh, in the early 2000s. And if you go to the next page, you'll see that um, the second half of my data set contains uh, G proteins from viruses isolated uh, between 2016 and 2021. So I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to select all of these 100 proteins in my data set and click on um, the metadata driven comparative analysis tool, MetaCATS. And I'm going to confirm that these are amino acid sequences because they are for, for the G glycoprotein. And I'm going to select uh, autogrouping. And uh, in the drop down menu, you can select how you'd like to um, use the metadata that's, associ that's associated with these sequences to, um, <clears throat> to uh, divide them up into different groups. So I'm going to choose year over here, although you can choose uh, a couple of other different methods. Um, and I need to provide uh, the breakpoint over here. Um, so since I'm interested in everything before 2006 and everything after um, 2006, um, I'm going to just put down 2006. And these are unaligned uh, FASTA sequences. I'm going to leave the p-value as the default and click uh, continue. And so this just shows me uh, the grouping um, of the of how it's uh, selected the sequences based on the metadata that's associated. So you can see that I have 50 sequences um, that are from the early 2000s and uh, 50 sequences that are from uh, the most recent uh, five years. And I can go ahead and click on run. 
and that usually uh, again is uh, processed relatively quickly. Um, and the results are given to you um, displayed in a table like this. Um, so you have, um, it shows you the positions that are different between the two different groups, gives you the chi-square value and the p-value, which give you um, the statistical significance for uh, each position, uh, the degrees of freedom. And if you're interested in learning a little bit more on how these different values are calculated, I would encourage you to read uh, uh, the SOP documentation for this tool. And um, in the last column, it will give you an idea of uh, the diversity of these different uh, groups. For example, um, group one uh, mainly will have uh, uh, lysine at this position, whereas in group two, uh, this seems to have shifted to an arginine. Um, and you can uh, sort this table by p-value, for example. Um, <clears throat> and so the ones at the top now are those um, that are the most uh, significantly different. So, for example, group one has a proline in position 121, whereas group two um, mostly contains serine at position 121. So it's it's quite a nice way of identifying um, perhaps positions that have been under uh, selection in in a certain genome or a protein that you're interested in, and you can do this for both uh, uh, DNA sequences or RNA sequences, nucleic acid sequences, and uh, protein sequences. So I'm just going to check on the time and questions and um, check whether our guest speaker is here before we um, decide whether we should uh, move on to our guest lecture. Richard, is there anything else in particular I should highlight um, before we move on? <coughs> Maybe you can show people <clears throat> who um, are not already registered um, how to sign up for a workbench account where they can kind of save their sure. um, their working sets of sequences and their analysis results. Sure. So um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, log out so that I can uh, show you what you need to do. Um, so if you uh, are interested in um, going to So I'll just start a new one. Um, there we go. So if you're interested in uh, going to your workbench, you can choose a specific taxon and I'll choose, let's say, Numa Verde. Um, oops, still logged in. How do I not know how to log out? There we go, log out. <laughs> All right. So if you want to um, sign up for a workbench, it's quite easy. You just click on register. Um, enter your email address and a password um, and just provide some very basic information um, and just go ahead and click on register. Uh, once you are registered, it's pretty quick to just sign in. And then um, you will have access to uh, your database, uh, your workbench, where you can um, where it automatically saves any analysis or search that you perform for about 24 hours. Um, and if you'd like to save your analysis, let's say um, the results of the Metacats analysis I just did, uh, you can just click it and um, <clears throat> um, you can uh, save that to your workbench. Um, for example, just click uh, Save Analysis. Um, you can also um, from your workbench directly. Um, for example, I have some uh, saved data sets. Um, so, for example, these uh, nine uh, G glycoproteins from the different um, metanumovar from the different numoveridae um, <clears throat> uh, species, and you can select them all and go directly to running an analysis um, and just. For example, make a, a quick tree from these 
um, just by clicking on generate phylogenetic tree. And um, you can also, uh, from your workbench, um, <clears throat> and that's pretty quick, I think, so I'm just going to give you a quick idea of what the tree looks like and um, midpoint root that. And this just shows you the basic families of the uh, metanumovirus and um, orthonumoviridae. So it's really quick. It's it's really handy for getting an idea of what's in your data set. Um, and what's more is you can uh, share your data sets with colleagues um, and you can share the results of your analysis with colleagues by just clicking on the data sets and um, uh, going to sharing and share with a collaborator. Uh, or if you have particularly large data sets, um, you can share it um, that, that's relevant to the public. You can ask us to share it um, with, with the public. And that is it, I think. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Richard, or? Oh, I'll just say that um, if you do need support um, for Viper, if you have any questions, if you want to walk through, um, if you or your group or your institution uh, would like a quick, um, a, a quick tutorial about anything, we can uh, tailor our presentations to you. Uh, and we do provide that. There's also some useful uh, material for just learning in terms of tutorials. Um, and I've been providing uh, some uh, tutorials on our YouTube channel as well. If you have a problem, you can just uh, click on report a problem um, and just tell us what's, what's wrong. Um, and I would just encourage you to include the ticket number uh, for your analysis, which will be uh, really helpful in helping us figure out the problem. Even if you just have a science question or a technical question, you can also reach out to us and just email us your problem. Okay, so I see a question. Can I perform a multi locus sequence typing in CryptoDB? Is it possible? Um, I wonder if Omar is here. Ah, Omar, maybe you can answer that question. <laughs> Um, sorry, can you repeat the question? Actually, I was uh, it was something about crypto DB. Yeah. Yeah. So someone is actually asking, can I perform multi locus sequence typing in crypto DB? Um, no, we don't have a tool for well. So we load all um, isolates from uh, GenBank. Um, so all the popset isolates of all the organisms that are in ViewPath DB, we load them into um, crypto DB, for example. So all the cryptosporidium isolates get in there. Uh, we collect the metadata that's available. So if we, because uh, sometimes that's that's a bit of a mess and we have, and we don't want to manually curate them because there are thousands upon thousands of isolates. Uh, so we do an automated curation of those and we pull out, for example, the geographic location and the uh, uh, isolation source. And then um, we also map the sequence from that isolate uh, back to the genome. So we basically blast it back to the genome and we tell you which locus it aligned to. So, for example, uh, if for Cryptosporidium you're using uh, GP6040, for example, for the typing, um, then it'll align to that gene, right? And then um, you can select a number of isolates uh, that you retrieve from the database and run a multiple sequence alignment. Um, but you can you, and obviously you can blast your sequence against the, the, the isolates in the database. So that's one way to sort of type your isolate. But it's not multi locus. You kind of have to do them all uh, individually to be able to um, um, sort of get at the answer you're you're looking for. So hopefully, hopefully that answers your question. And and if you have more questions about VU Path DB or any of the other eukaryotic pathogens, I'll just point out that um, there will be a talk in two weeks on May fourth on Aspergillus and fungi DB. Um, and so they can answer all your questions there as well. Okay, so I think we're almost at the top of the hour. So, Richard, maybe we should uh, introduce Chris. I see he's here. Yeah, why don't we go ahead and um, get ready for Chris's presentation? So, we're happy.
happy to have him here from University of Rochester Medical School. Um, he is currently a postdoctoral fellow in the lab of Tom Mariani. And um, one of the things that I think Chris exemplifies in his research program is his ability to combine computational analysis with wet lab experimentation. Um, and he's been kind of applying these techniques to really understand what are the genetic determinants of disease severity for, um, for RSV. Um, and so um, we invited him to give the guest lecture today, which is entitled um, Genetic Variation and Disease Severity of Respiratory Syncytial Virus. Um, thanks, Chris, for, for attending, and we look forward to your presentation. Good job. Um, I'll try to share my screen. Perfect. That looks good. Um, all right. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. Um, Chris Anderson. I'm at the uh, University of Rochester, Department of Pediatrics. So I'll be talking about genetic variation uh, in disease severity of respiratory syncytial virus. <clears throat> so I guess just to preference this, um, like Richard said, I do a lot of uh, experimentational work as well as computational work. Um, and so we have been using developed mo in vitro models to understand what RSV is doing to, to lung cells. And just like everyone else in the field, we've been using the standard uh, typical, prototypical uh, virus strains, A2 or, or B1, um, to do these experiments. And so through these uh, kind of like, learning more about RSV, I come from the influenza field, uh, we started asking questions, well, you know, is, are we using the right strain? Are all RSV strains the same? Um, you know, you can talk to some people and they will say, oh, RSV doesn't change. And talk to other people and they'll say, well, look at the G protein. Um, so the field is really uh, you know, still trying to figure this out. And so, you know, I walked into, you know, being a part of this uh, group at University of Rochester um, that was trying to do just this. And, and so uh, with Richard, actually, we uh, started doing this. So, uh, okay. Um, so I luckily don't have to give a huge introduction because uh, one, a great one was already given. Um, so just real quickly, um, you know, I'm in pediatrics, you know, this is a really important uh, virus when it comes to newborns, um, you know, ask any pediatrician, you know, this is what we're looking for uh, when a kid comes in uh, uh, sick with a runny nose, right? Do they have RSV? Uh, and if they do, you know, we take serious precautions um, often with therapeutics. So it's a leading, leading cause of hospitalization and second leading cause of death in humans and infants worldwide. Uh, so from the first year of life, if you get a, a RSV, you know, it, it's serious. Uh, there's also, and this is, you know, still being studied, you know, there, there's this idea that RSV causes recurrent wheezing, you know, which is, you know, called asthma as, as you get older um, in the first years of life. So, you know, there's a possibility that this virus not only can ha cause acute problems, but actually can cause uh, long-term chronic issues. Um, there are some, uh, some risk factors, major risk factors uh, associated with RSV, uh, you know, congenital heart disease, and anything involved, involved in the heart, Down syndrome, uh, we're interested in prematurity here, so we've studied that a lot. Um, in young age of time infection, there seems to be this very high correlation uh, that the younger that you are, the more the chance you're gonna have a severe disease, regardless if you're premature or not. Um, there's also things like low levels of maternal to drive, RSV stiffened antibody, lack of breastfeeding, and uh, tobacco smoke exposure. Uh, so uh, the, the virus is already, uh, shown, but so there, you know, it, you, I don't need to go into this, um, but there is a variety of proteins that exist in this virus, some uh, external, some, some internal. Um, and so, you know, we really wanted to understand, you know, kind of the variation that occurs in these proteins, if there is any, um, and if there's any association this variation with disease severity. So uh, they do a variety of things. I'm not going to go through this again, um, but, you know, we know certain functions of these. And so we could uh, assume you know, if there's variation in some of these proteins, you know, we'll be fine a, a different virus or some, some altering of the, the function. Um, and would that some, would that contribute to RSV induced disease severity? Um, and as of now, we don't really know much about that. Uh, there has been some papers describing RSV A versus RSV B and their role in disease severity. Um, but those have been, you know, few and far between and they're contradictory sometimes. So we don't really have a good understanding, especially within, say, RSVA or within RSVB, how that variation is contributing. 
the other thing we were uh, interested in this is there's a lot of, as was mentioned, there's a lot of vaccines in development right now. Um, and they all, a lot of them come off the same, same assumption that, you know, we can, if we're going to make a, say, attenuated virus, then they're going to use that prototypical uh, RSV strain. Is that the best one? I, I don't know. Um, if there's one more associated severity, perhaps uh, that'd be a better choice. Um, you know, there, a lot of these are based on the F protein, which is thought to be, you know, more conserved. You know, so is, if that's true, maybe that, you know, this would, this work would support and we need to concentrate you know, on F. That is important. So, yeah, this is part of our, our motivation. Okay. So, what we did. Um, so, uh, with the University of Rochester and KCVI, we, we got together and we decided to uh, get some RSV sequences. So um, at that time, there was very limited, there still is very limited, a numbers of whole genome sequences for RSV, uh, despite its importance. Um, it, it's very much understudied. Go look at uh, COVID or influenza databases, and you, you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, th those are huge. It's unfortunate that there's so much less in RSV. But uh, to those ends, we decided, and other groups are, are doing this too, um, that we had long-term storage of samples. So uh, way before you know, I was around in science, um, there was a pediatrician, um, Caroline Hall in particular, who collected nasal swabs from RSV-positive children. Um, so we, we simply were looking at first uh, flu in cold season, so the first eight months of life. <clears throat> and uh, they collected these samples uh, over 20 years, from 1977 to 1998, and they put them in a freezer and they sat there. And so we decided that uh, we would take these out and, and sequence them. And so we also had associated medical records. So the uh, clinicians that we work with were able to go through these medical records and they could actually tell us this person had mild cases, you know, these were mostly outpatients and these person had severe cases. And they went through the actual medical records to confirm um, that at least by what, what was written that these are actually mild or severe cases of RSV. And then we took uh, those samples and we sequenced them and we got a uh, vi whole viral genome sequences for about 160 uh, uh, sequences. And please feel free to stop me or get questions. Okay, so uh, the first thing we did <clears throat> well, after aligning the sequences is we just looked at the phylogeny. So you saw a similar tree to this, um, that you get this huge separation of RSV A and RSV B. And then you do get these clades and this clustering within each subtype, uh, although the nomenclature has not really been worked out very well. Um, and so, I, you know, I hesitate to even put labels on top of some of these clades. Um, so that, that's one limitation in the field is it's hard to actually start talking about, uh, you know, are these actual distinct, defined distinct clades uh, or not? But we certainly see that there is um, these subclades that exist within the subtypes. So we wanted to ask if there was a relationship between disease severity and phylogeny. So we use the BATS algorithm. So the BATS algorithm uh, gives us uh, three different types of statistical tests. So it can use, uh, uh, it can use random permutations of the traits. So in this case, severe disease, mild or, or, or severe disease. And it can ask, it can give you a couple statistics. So association index, uh, proximity score, score um, statistic. Um, and it can do it like, a, uh, they can do this Monte Carlo, um, method that <clears throat> using the Bayesian uh, uh, trees. So what this tells you is that, you know, do we expect to see, uh, is our traits distributed in this, in this tree different than what we expect by randomization? Um, and this was actually the first real insight we had that, you know, maybe something was going on. And, and, you know, we were lucky that we had these whole genomes and we could actually ask this question, right? Like we had, a, we believe we have a very good representative tree. Um, and so we saw that two of the statistics, uh, the association index and possibly score, which are very classical uh, uh, tests, showed that there was a clinical, uh, there was significant association with disease severity in the phylogeny. Now, there's also uh, a more new uh, type of test that, that will look at individual traits and will ask, you know, is there a, you would expect that if you were, say, a severe virus that it was, was derived from a severe child, that your neighbor virus in that tree would also uh, be severe. And that's exactly what these uh, types of tests do. And they ask those sort of questions uh, within the, these monoclades. And so they, you can see that we actually found with the severe case, severe traits that yes, there was actually more a chance that if you were in a monoclade severe that you would be, uh, you would have 
neighbors that had that that trait as well. And uh, but this was not true with mild. And so, you know, what what that may mean is that the the you know not to overinterpret, but that the variability in the mild sequences, you know, could be random variability and not associated with uh, any type of phenotype. Whereas the severe might actually be like there may be a limited number of types of viruses that cause severe severity. Um, but that's, that's a little over interpretation. But this was very encouraging. This was the first real data we had that uh, suggested maybe something was going on. And we would find that C severity had something to do with genetic variation. And so the next thing was we knew that the, the since the phylogenetic tree was based on whole genome sequences, we couldn't associate if there was a particular protein uh, that was contributed to that phylogeny. So instead, uh, we decided to go protein by protein and do comparisons within the protein. So here I'm just going to show you, what, you know, one example. So say we have uh, two amino acid sequences from the G protein from two different uh, isolates. We can take their uh, the number of amino acid cha changes, the Hamming distance uh, between these two sequences, and say in this case this is five. We can calculate the percent di differences. And we can do that for every single strain, do every single comparison, and we end up with a distance matrix that simply describes the amount of amino acid substitutions uh, between all the strains. And so we did this for every single protein within uh, subtype. So, you know, RSV A, G was done separately than RSV B, G. And so the first thing we looked at was, so here's a, a graph uh, that shows you the number of amino acid substitutions that we found. So the first bar being, uh, the subtype A uh, G, pro G protein, and the we found that up, up, we found up to 60 uh, amino acid substitutions, over 60 amino acid substitutions between stra strains. Um, so, th and this was not unexpected. This is exactly what we expect. Uh, literature has shown that the G protein is the most highly variable, um, but we have found variation in, in all the proteins. Although the level of variation uh, did change, um, so the L, the, the large uh, polymerase subunit, um, had a lot of variation. Uh, but the, you know, it's it's worth noting that that is a huge, uh, huge protein. Um, so this is does not take into account the protein length. But we did find variation in all proteins, uh, including the F, the F protein, which went up to a little over ten uh, amino acid differences. And when you adjust for length, um, which allows a better comparison between uh, the different types of proteins, uh, we start seeing a, a kind of an interesting picture that, you know, the, the G protein still stays. Um, so regardless of the length, it, it is still the most variable. Um, the L protein does go away. So the, the large size accounts for most of its uh, variability. Um, but we see this M22 gene um, come up to be hi highly variable, which was Slightly, which was unexpected, uh, to be honest. Um, that it does seem that this M22 protein seems to be pretty variable in both RSVA and RSVP. Uh, we did uh, somewhat see uh, slight differences between RSVA and RSVP as far as the number of amino acid changes that occurred, but it really was dependent on the, the protein of interest. So, you know, this was uh, told us that there there is a lot of variability that's going on in, the, in this, the, or this protein, or at least that, you know, we might, we may want to start paying attention to some of these, uh, these, this, these proteins with highly variable regions. And so um, we could see that there was variation, as I showed with the box plot, but one thing we wanted to do is we wanted to try to visualize um, this variation. And so we use a, just a lower uh, dimension of space. So you can just take a, the distance matrix, and you can put it into principal coordinate analysis uh, and get a nice uh, PCOA map. And then you can color uh, by your status, outpatient versus inpatient, and try to get some visualization. Is there, you know, maybe some clustering uh, that's occurring? And so uh, that's what we did. Uh, so you can see here, I'm going to show you this example um, that for the RSVA and RSVB uh, G proteins, uh, we saw two very distinct things. So on the left-hand side, you see the PicoA uh, plot for RSVAG, and we see that there is uh, significant differences in grouping. You're looking at the, the centroids here between the inpatient and out outpatient samples, but that was not true for RCB. So you can clearly see that the, the centroids, at least, are, are not overlapping uh, in the right-hand uh, RSVB G protein PicoA plot. Um, so this was interesting. Um, it, it, 
showed that there maybe is a association with this uh, variation in these proteins, at least for some of uh, the for one of the subtypes. And for RSV, uh, sorry, for M22, um, we saw actually for both subtypes that there, there seemed to be uh, this this grouping difference um, that they seem to separate in this lower dimensional space. Um, they seem to somewhat group uh, by their their inpatient or outpatient status. So um, this was encouraging, but this does not. Uh, we needed a statistical way. Um, so you know, it's nice to visualize, but we needed to you know, statistically associate these two things. And so um, we used two tests. So again, we took this this matrix, um, and we put it. We did two different types of tests. So we did adonis two and nauseum. And so this was a little bit of the. Uh, I guess this is the novelty of the, the approach here that we. It took us a while to figure out exactly how to do this. So, you know, the idea was, you know, pretty, the question that we was simple and how to do it was a little harder. So we just asked the question, you know, are RSV variants with similar trait characteristics, mild versus severe disease, more likely to be spatially located together in sequence variation space, right? So you have this distance matrix, you can imagine it's, you know, it's got, it's got as many dimensions as there are row, row, rows, which uh, there's 160, right? So 160 dimensional space. And you asked, you know, if you're in this, you know, crazy dimensional space, are you more likely, if you're severe, to be sitting next to people with the other strains that were isolated from severe patients, um, or are you not? And so, the luckily the ecology folks have two very well established um, tools. This is Donus Two, which is Permanova uh, and Nozum, which can be used to ask just that question: If you have a space and you have uh, species with different traits, a species with different traits, can you? find spatial, uh, do they, can you statistically determine if there are differences in their spatial location uh, in this variation space? And so, and we use the two different tools just for uh, ro abundance, uh, for, for robustness. Um, they have slightly different dependencies on the degrees of freedom. So we wanted to include uh, two different tests. They are independent, but they're both uh, non parametric Okay, so what we found, and so, most of the genes we did not find uh, an association with. Um, so the only ones we did was we found the G protein, the M22 protein, and the NS2 protein um, had an association with its disease severity. So if you took this, the protein, if you were a G protein in variation space and you were severe, you'd be more likely to be located next to a severe, another isolated severe strain. Um, so this was, you know, very interesting, and I showed you the visualization of plots. We, this was not unexpected that the B, uh, the GB subtype B uh, did not was not typically associated, um, but then M22 again uh, was, which we were uh, we were surprised. Now I want to put on the NS2 um, two a little caveats here. So uh, for one of the tests, the nozum, it was not uh, sniffly, statistically significant. For the other, it was. And this is partially. This is uh, the NS2 is a lot less degree to degrees of freedom uh, than the other proteins. There's, there's just less mutations that it can have occurred. Um, so take this with a little grain of salt. Um, it's hard to know if this is just because of this few mutations, or this is actually true. Um, it is interesting because you know anyone who's been studying influenza knows these NS proteins are sometimes it get very associated with severity because uh, they interfere with the interferon response. Um, that remains to be understood. But this was um, good. So we saw for at least for three or three different proteins, we saw some significant and some significance, uh, including that M22 protein. Okay, and so I showed you that, you know, we, we saw this associated with phylogeny, we went the next step to go within the, the genome and say, you know, is, is there certain proteins associated it with it. And then we wanted to ask, you know, the real question, you know, is there certain amino acids uh, associated with it? Where can we find actually specific changes um, that if you have these changes, you're much more likely to be uh, severe, to be isolated from a child with severe disease. And so uh, the Medicaps was already presenting, which is great. Um, so if, and I should say every single thing I've done here, most of the stuff I've done here, I, I did on Viper um, and certainly can be done on Viper. Um, so the you can form the metacats. Like I said, we had the disease severity, so we had mild and, and um, severe as our metadata, and so we could just ask, you know, it performs this chi-squared test at every single amino acid position, 
and says, is there a, an association? And so what we found, So we found 10 different positions uh, that were associated with disease severity. So the in the RSV A, subtype A, G protein, uh, we found seven different uh, positions that you were, that were variation in that position was associated with disease severity. And then with the M22B, but not A, um, we did find um, some some variations, position, positions, variation at those positions associated with severity. Um, this was encouraging. This, this, so this told us we may be able to go the next step, um, which you know, I, I, we haven't done yet, and start making some of these proteins uh, in, in some of these viruses with substitutions in, in these positions and ask these direct questions. So we're going to see some sort of functional, you know, output in, in mice or, you know, in, in vitro um, with viruses that have uh, some of these mutations. Okay, um, so in conclusion, uh, RSV is genetically diverse in our local community, right? Uh, so maybe I should emphasize this, right? This was all is isolated here in Rochester over 20 years, right? So this is in this hospital around here, we can isolate this many different genetically diverse uh, viruses. And we did find a, a statistical association uh, between RSV phylogeny and disease severity. Uh, RSV proteins, we, we found the G and the M22 proteins uh, were statistically associated with disease severity, and we found 10 amino acid positions. So, um, you know, this is great and encouraging. What we don't know. Um, unfortunately, is how reproducible this is, right? So this, in our data set, in, in our hands, this is what we found over this time period in this location. Um, but it's really hard to make any really solid conclusions until we have a validation of the data set. Um, and just the fortunate way of things is that that data doesn't yet exist. Um, so even asking questions such as, uh, is the variation that we find uh, similar to other strains around the world, um, that data is so limited, especially when you look at the at whole genome, uh, it's very hard to try to make some of those conclusions. So though we're, we're happy with these results, um, you know, I guess I'm a little pitching that hopefully, you know, other people and you know, we've on this call and, you know, around the world will start looking more at RSV variation and start asking some of these uh, very important questions, um, especially given we are on the verge of hopefully having a vaccine. And we would like to know, you know, is there a particular strain that should be included that is more such with severity? So let me just do my acknowledgements. Uh, so uh, first, I guess my postdoctoral committee. Uh, so uh, Tom Mariani is my current mentor. Uh, David Topham uh, was my PhD mentor and is currently on my committee. And uh, Edward Walsh um, is an RSV guru and taught me basically everything I know about, about RSV. Um, the Department of Pediatrics, so Caroline Hall, um, she collected most of these samples. Uh, Mary Caserta was the uh, clinician who really piloted all this stuff and got this thing going. Um, and also looked through all the medical records. And Chini, Chini Chu helped with some of the analysis. Um, part of the spouse statistics and the biology, we had some statistical help and much discussion, especially when we were talking about doing the Permanova. Um, this was a collaboration with, with a JCBI. And so, you know, thank you guys. Um, Jan Richard, it was, you know, it's, been, it's been fun. We've learned a lot. And uh, the funding source, um, it's originally funded by the RPRC uh, uh, and program through the NAAD. Um, we received some local funding through the uh, our SAC uh, incubator program here, uh, as well as I've received uh, a couple of training grants and then a uh, uh, a grant to study uh, computational algorithms uh, in respiratory viruses. So um, thank you, everyone, and uh, please ask me any, any questions. All right, fantastic. Thank you so much, Chris. So <clears throat> we yeah, definitely... it looks like there are several questions in the chat. So um feel free to unmute yourself if you would prefer to ask your question live otherwise we could just read those questions for you well let me start with one chris and then we can move on to the questions in the chat so yeah i noticed when when you were showing the results from the medicats analysis of the g protein it looked like there um there might be linkage disequilibrium between the substitutions at the different sites because the number of 
uh, sequences that had a particular variation was the same. For example, you see that the at the third position, 22N, and then at the fourth, 22H, and at the fifth, 22L, you know, that, that's typically kind of a pattern that you see when there is linkage disequilibrium between the substitutions. So I'm just wondering if you've looked into that at all. No, 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 that's a good point. I mean, I, I, I completely agree with you. It, it seems to be a, a linkage disequilibrium, and we haven't, but that is actually a, a really good suggestion, especially just to uh, further demonstrate that, you know, things aren't, that there is something perhaps going on. Um, and it doesn't seem to be this random um, uh, evolution. So the, yeah, no, we, we, I haven't looked at that yet, but I think that's, that's a good next step. Write that down. Yeah, it looks very interesting. Okay, so there was another question um, and uh, says, I'm sorry if I've missed it, uh, but what was the sample size for the study? How many patients were analyzed? Sorry, yeah, I, I said that quickly. Um, it was 160 uh, patients were analyzed, roughly split between A and B and roughly split, split between mild and severe. Okay. Um, and then there's another question. Have you considered the use of the RSV proteins found in your study for vaccine production? Yeah, absolutely. So that's, that was one of the main uh, motivators as we've been on our end, been thinking about subtype vaccines, um, such the RSVG subtype vaccines. Uh, and, you know, how do you choose since there is so much variability uh, in the G protein? How do you choose one? Or maybe you don't, maybe you choose a few. Um, so, so yes, and that's exactly what we're thinking. You know, can we find ones that are more uh, social severity, or you know, should we also just include multiple uh, strains um, to cover all the different types of variation we we find? So, yes, absolutely, we, we are. Yeah, so Chris I guess I, maybe I should also. Oh, uh, yeah, but one, sorry, one last thing. The uh, the the other thing um, which is interesting, and I, I know Ed Wall thought, thought this was very interesting. Was that this M22? So one of the can vaccine candidates that are, that are in late phases right now um, is an attenuated virus that's missing the M22 protein. So you know what association that, that has, I'm not sure, but I, it is interesting to me that we're finding an association with the M22 protein, uh, and that's also associated with the attenuation of the virus itself. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so Chris, along the lines of you know the vaccines. You know, you, you showed that, you know, there's quite a bit of variability in G versus F. And so um, well, F is not the, the uh, target of the vaccine approaches because it seems like that would be a more stable target. Yeah, it, so it has been for the most part. Uh, the, it, it is, right? There are some people have protein vaccines out there, um, the ones that are, are aiming to reduce um, antibodies against F. Uh, one of the problems with the F is that uh, it's unstable. So you you'd like it has a pre-fusion and a post-fusion mm -hmm. uh, confirmation, and so you would like to have the pre-fusion confirmation antibodies towards that. And obviously, if you uh, there there has been issues in the past with the, uh, inducing antibodies towards the post-fusion, which are non-neutralizing and actually might uh, enhance the disease. So we have not chosen to do the F protein path simply because the G protein seems to be the primary attachment protein so we using you know primary lung models you know not cell culture mm -hmm. not, not cell lines um, we're seeing clearly that these things bind ch301 and that you know that that is very if we can block the interaction by antibodies <laughs> or you know, just using peptides we can significantly reduce um the amount of virus um so that's you know one of the uh, one of the reasons why we thought of using g as well that it's secreted so you know thought that you know maybe if you had antibodies that could block this secreted g you might have a better immune response in general. Uh, even if it was F, F protein immunity that you were looking for, it might require blocking actually this G protein in order to get the, the F uh, available. So yeah, I guess, I don't know if that answered your question, but I, I think F is definitely going to be, uh, you know, hopefully it's going to be successful uh, to be able to bind multiple strains, but I guess we'll, we'll, due to its concentration, but we'll see. You know, I don't know, many people may not realize it, but with the coronavirus, many of the coronavirus vaccines, they actually have a mutation in the spike protein to stabilize the structure because I think, um, you know, the spike protein has a similar issue as as F uh, for RSV in terms of, you know, being flexible and, 
and that impacting the ability to generate a good response. Yeah, and I think it was the primary research on RSV that kind of um, led them to putting in that double proline that stabilizes the spike protein. So we have the RSV field to thank for that. Um, so I also had a quick question. Um, can it, when you're determining the disease severity of these older cases, is it possible that bacterial co-infections or other co-infections can um, be a confounding factor in these studies? Absolutely. Um, so that's that we are also at the same time uh, right now studying uh, specifically uh, non-type of Moffitt's influenza and what role that's playing uh, in these infections. And so we don't know. So, they, so we definitely know that there's a high correlation between disease severity and presence of some bacterial species in the lungs. Um, that's been clear. But what we don't know is, is this variation affecting that interaction or is this a separate? So you can have a severe disease because you have a co-infection or maybe you can have severe disease because you have a certain uh, virus isolate uh, that's infecting you. And, and so I, I will say I would bet that there is a component here that has to do with the bacteria um, and that we might actually find that, you know, certain G proteins, for instance, you know, maybe like to stick a little better than others. Okay, thanks. Um, so they, we just got a couple more questions um, and it's the questions are, um, if I understood clearly the variable, um, or variability is greatest with the G, N, M, S, or the M22 proteins. Is that right? Is that most of the variation yeah, was so, in the G? Yeah, so, I mean, it, again, it depends if you want to look at this per, you know, the, if you want to look at the entire amino acid, the entire, you know, how many substitutions occurred versus how many substitutions occurred per protein length. Um, so, right, if you look at it, the whole, uh, just how many substitutions occurred. Actually, L has, has a ton, and M2 doesn't have that much. Mm -hmm. But the difference, you know, in size is, you know, thousands of amino acids. So the, you know, if you look at it per uh, amino acid length, then yes, that's exactly what you find. That the G protein seems to be the most variable with M2 to uh, follow behind. And so for the M2 gene that has the two overlapping uh, reading frames, is that only in the second uh, reading frame or the part that does not? Overlap with M1. Right. Yeah. It's, yeah. So yeah. Yeah, right. That's what that's. Yes. Yeah, exactly. That's what this would suggest. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and then. Um, so, and when when you mentioned um, that there's kind of a prox um, a relationship between the proximity of these amino acids together, is that. Um, like a two dimensional uh, proximity, like let's say position 100 and position 101, or did I misunderstand? Um, that? You talking about when I was saying, uh, when you used talking the, about with, with, with they occurred in, yeah, okay, no, so that's that's not where the amino acid occurred next to each other in the linear strain. Okay. That's if you are an isolate and you have another isolate that say you only have one or two amino acids different from you, you're more likely to have the same trait okay. as that yeah. isolate than somebody at 10, right? All right, perfect, thanks. Um, and then Richard, there was a final question. Um, are these kinds of analysis uh, or can they be done using tools available in Viper? Um, I think Chris can answer that question because some tools in Viper and then you used some scripts that you wrote yourself, I believe, correct? Yeah, yeah. So the the alignment, uh, phylogenetics um, can be done uh, on Viper. Uh, you can't yet, so maybe I can convince Richard, um, <laughs> create these distance matrices. Um, so that, that's yet to be done. Um, and, and this is probably made the, one of the first times Richard has seen our new method of uh, doing statistics with them. But yeah, so I've been, I use R, um, I actually use these distant matrix, matrix in R using the aligned uh, file that I download 
um, from Viper. It's, it's a you know few lines of code. It's pretty straightforward. And I'm happy to share with anyone who wants to you know, ask questions. Just email me. Yeah, it looks like that could be a pretty useful uh, new addition to Viper. So we'll have to follow up with you, Chris. Okay, so it is after 930 and it looks like we are um, done with questions in the chat. Unless anyone else has any last minute questions on either the talk or Viper. Um, <clears throat> okay, otherwise I will just remind uh, everyone about our upcoming uh, talks. And um, if you're interested in um, any other um, any other uh, respiratory pathogens, we have Aspergillus coming up on May 4th, and Teraviruses and Picorna Verde um, on the 18th of May, and Bacterial Respiratory Pathogens and the Patrick Database on the 1st of June. Um, and if you have any other questions, I'll stay on for uh, the next five minutes. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for attending, and we hope to see you guys again soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for your interesting presentation, Chris. Thanks for having me.